Hi, my name is Kathleen Luzinski, and I'm here representing the Swift Nature Camp. I'm presenting Backyard Birding 101. I would like to thank, and so does Swift Nature Camp, thank the College of DuPage for hosting the STEM conference and inviting Swift Nature Camp to participate in it. Swift Nature Camp is located in the north woods of Wisconsin. Nature embodies everything about the camp from all of the activities that they do inside the uh, nature center or catching the frogs or swimming and archery and the counselors as well. Everybody is well versed in the nature of the area. We have evening activities, there's a pet petting zoo there that the, the campers can hang out in during their free time. And we've got a resident pig called Bubba. Bubba sticks his snout into everybody's business all day long. I'm going to ask you right now to come along on a virtual adventure into easy birding in your own backyard. As we start, I'm asking you to think about the birds that you have seen in your backyard or near your home. You can write down your ideas or talk about them with someone who's watching the video with you. So what'd you guys come up with? How about a robin? Did you list a robin? Here, there's a picture of a male and a female robin. We know these are round. Um, the male robin has a darker head and this orange breast and the female robin is more subtle in coloration with the gray head, the gray back and the lighter orange breast. How about a cardinal? Did you list a cardinal? Look at how different the male and the female are there. The male is the one on the left, bright red, the more subtle colors with the female. Female birds, they tend to sit on the nest longer than the male, so they try to be more camouflaged so that predators don't find them as easily while they're trying to hatch their eggs. Even these two birds, they'll have similarities with the crest and the red beaks. Species of birds that show the differences between the male and the female is called sexual dimorphism. Sexual refers to the gender of the birds. Di refers to two. Morph is their structure. So they have different structures for the two different genders. It's great for us because we can easily tell the males and the females, but not all bird species do do that. Did you list a sparrow? Lots of sparrows around here. This probably was a house sparrow. They do hang around in groups. They don't mind being in backyards and even in towns and they chirp around. They sit in trees. They also hop around on the ground. They feed off of bird feeders. They're, they're pretty active birds. But it could have been a song sparrow, could have been a tree sparrow. And as summer comes along, there's even other types of sparrows. Did you list a blue jay? We don't see those too often, but they are big, spectacular, loud birds. You're going to find them if you've got an oak tree around that has acorns. That's what they like to feed upon. How about a hawk? You're going to have to look up overhead into the sky to look for a hawk. Um, if there's a hawk up there soaring around and his tail is splayed out and it looks reddish underneath, it's probably it will be a red-tailed hawk. However, during the wintertime, it's pretty easy to see Cooper's hawks sitting on fence posts or in trees Near backyards, they like to, to find birds that hang around bird feeders. Um, how about a vulture? We have vultures around here. They're called turkey vultures. They You will only see them soaring up high as they're looking for the carrion that they're going to be feeding upon. Usually one or two will hang around together soaring. An owl. It's difficult to spot an owl, but you could hear them hooting at night, especially between October and March. October, November, December, the owls are mating. And during January, February, March, they're on their nests uh, hatching those eggs. Mid-March, they usually are hatched and the little ones have hatched and the, the male and the female are out trying to find food. But they also will sing to each other. It's called a duet. So here's one of the owls that we have around here. It's called a great horned owl, and it goes, hoo, 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 hoo. well, listen to this video, and you'll hear what it really sounds like. You only need a few seconds of the video. <laughs> Another owl that you may hear around here but it's got to be in your water. It's called a barred owl. And they are very distinctive. They have a distinctive call that is ooh, 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 something like that. 
Here's a video to hear one or two calling to each other. <laughs> Do mallard ducks or Canada geese visit your yard? Some people like that and some people don't like having those birds in their yards. On the left, you see the mallard ducks and then the far left is going to be the female, again, showing you sexual dimorphism. And here is the male who looks very different and more colorful than the female. She's the one who sits on the nest. Um, and then we've got the Canada geese and they do not show a lot of differences between the males and the females, so we cannot identify those as easily. How does one learn about a bird that you don't already know? In other words, how do I identify a bird? An easy way is to use a simple backyard bird guide or bird book. Here's two that are shown. The one on the left is specific to the Midwest. The one on the right is also for um, our area. I especially like the one on the right because the pictures inside have illustrations of the birds and indicating the field markings. Field markings are the things that you wanna look for on that bird to identify it. And with this cardinal, again, it says the triangular shaped red bill or the black face or the red pointed crest. Again, the female's gonna have that. She's got the crest as well. So I do like the book on the right a little bit better because of this illustration. However, if you have like access to a cell phone, a great app to download is called Merlin by Cornell Labs. The Merlin app looks like this. Gives you identifying information, lets you listen to it. It's got a lot of things on the website. My, uh, my favorite part about that app is that it, the app actually limits the number of bird species in your to what is in your area at that particular time. So for instance, in wintertime in Illinois, around me, there's about 20 different species that I could see. And that's my choice of the birds. So I'm not looking through a gigantic book looking for other birds. I love the app. I highly recommend it. Um, Colonel Labs also has downloadable charts of local hawks or the little brown birds that are confusing or hummingbirds. You can also buy a laminated chart like the one that's shown on the right. If I use a chart or use the book, a guide, I tend to write in that book when I see the bird for the first time. I list where I saw it and the date that I saw it. I just like knowing that information. The first question you ask yourself when you see a bird is, what size is it? Is it the size of a sparrow, robin, crow, or goose? Next, what are its main colors? Is it iridescent blue? Is it um, indigo blue? Is it red? Does it have markings like this red-bellied woodpecker has this red swath that goes from its bill all the way to the nape on the back, the back of its neck? But we look for markings like that. Talking about markings, look at the markings of these wings and the pattern that is presented. This woodpecker belongs to a group of woodpeckers called ladderbacks, and that is because of this design on their back. Another thing you can you should look for is its habitat. Where is this? Is this near a field, near a pond, along a river, in a forest? And then is it on the side of a tree? Or is it hopping around on the ground? Or is it swimming in the lake? Or is it diving in the lake? So behaviors and habitat um, will help identify birds too. Some people keep a list of birds that they see. Here's what I mean by a bird observation page. The day of the week, the bird that you saw, how many times you saw it. Or I um, keep a list of the birds as they return during the spring migration or when they leave during their fall migration or when the winter migrants arrive. My favorite winter migrant bird is a red-breasted nuthatch. It is kind of a smaller bird, but it is so distinctive. Look at that black eye stripe right through its eye, then the white above, the white below, and that orange breast. One of my favorite winter migrants. 
However, most people would say that the dark-eyed juncos indicate the beginning and the end of spring. These two are only here during our winter. Um, they're called snowbirds commonly, mostly because of this white belly that brushes against the snow and they are ground feeders. So you'll see them hopping in the snow, digging in the snow. Um, good, good word is the snowbirds. And they're here during our winter time. Those, both of those birds will be leaving within the next next few days. Oh, oh this is, it's March right now. So they're gonna leave about the middle of March. I also list dates when certain spring flowers bloom like the daffodils or the crocuses, but I like to list when the American goldfinches lose their dull plumage for this bright black and yellow plumage. It is just stunning. Um, my records indicate that this change in plumage occurs between March 28th and April 7th. In 2020, that'd be the year of the pandemic, red-winged blackbirds returned to my yard March 3rd. But this year, it was February 27th, a few days earlier. These are my notes. Uh, there's a Facebook group called the Illinois Birding Network, and they people on there post their own sightings, and it makes me feel good or validates my observations when a lot of people are saying, oh, today I saw red-winged blackbirds for the first time. So I do like going to that Facebook group. This year, the Cardinals began singing February 12th, which was before our big snowstorm. I bet they were surprised. Here's what they sound like. It's a great sound to hear in the spring. Great sound to hear in the springtime. Uh, these listings of keeping track of when the birds arrive or when they sing are called data. And such information can be used by in scientific research by other people who might be tracking climate change and its effect on living things, or if there's an increase or a decrease in a particular species of birds, maybe we should be looking for a disease that is uh, affecting the birds. In the 90s, there was a bird disease that was called the West Nile virus, and it, it decimated our our crow population in our area, the black-capped chickadees, which have rebounded just fine, and blue jays were hard hit. So your observations can be uploaded to the Cardinal Labs where they uh, then have this data available for all kinds of people. Listening and talking, uh, listening to the bird songs and calls. Each species has its own call and its own song. Um, here's the song of a robin, which I'm sure you are familiar with, but it's just glorious to hear this when spring arrives. Commit those songs to memory, and if you get to see the bird singing it, you can see how it behaves. The cardinals you saw threw its head back when it would sing. People put stains to these songs to help them remember it. People say that a robin is said to sing, spring is here. Here are some of the helpful sayings in identifying bird songs. Birds are most notable during the spring. They sing, they flutter around attracting the mate. Males are brightly colored because, and they're looking very appealing, they're kind of showing off. They are looking for the mate as well. And the birds are building nests. So it's a fantastic time to start your birding experience. While here for the summer, many birds, they mate, they sit on their, their eggs, they hatch those eggs, and then they have to raise their young. Once they start raising their young, they become pretty quiet about that because they don't want a predator to find the nest with the little chicks in it. Feeding the chicks is time consuming, and the timing of their hatching needs to coincide as to when their food source is abundant. So what plants are blooming and of those plants, do they eat the nectar in the plants or do they eat the seeds of the plant or are they picking the petals off the plants? Or if they're insect eaters, what insects are flying around the plants and getting the nectar or what insects are, are available that these birds need to feed upon? Some birds are herbivores, some are carnivores, some are omnivores. Herbivores are those birds that eat vegetation, Carnivores are those that eat meat, and omnivores are those that eat both meat and vegetables. House wrens, 
Oh, that arrive around May 10th to my area are tiny birds, tiny, but they are so super busy gathering insects. You would be amazed. It's like every 90 seconds, the male and the female are coming back and forth with, with spiders or, or larva, caterpillars or grubs, anything they can find it. They find it among on the plants, hanging in the trees. Anyway, here's a video of a house wren feeding spiders to their young. Talking about nectar, have you ever seen a hummingbird or did you list a hummingbird? The species we have here is called the ruby-throated hummingbird. Look at that red ruby throat. It's called a gorget. This is the male ruby-throated hummingbird. He's got the coloration. The female's a little bit bigger, but she's much drabber than the male. These birds are very fast, but they do sit to rest on the slender branches of trees, kind of on the edge of a tree. Or in this case, I've got one sitting on a hummingbird swing made out of a clothes hanger. To attract hummingbirds, plant plants that produce red tubular flowers. Perennials such as Monarda, which is also known as bee balm, are one of their number one favorites in my backyard. Another one that I have, another plant, is called a cardinal flower. And uh, it too is a big hummingbird attractant. It uh, blooms a little bit later than, than the Monarda, but they both bloom a very long time. These are perennials, which means that they come back every year. You also can plant in your backyard, and it's very easy to plant these, a plant called zinnia. They are super colorful. They get pretty decent sized flowers and butterflies love zinnias. So do the hummingbirds. So do the goldfinches. You can grow zinnias from seed or from small plants that you can buy at a nursery. The cool thing about these zinnias are, is that they can be grown in a, a raised flower bed. So you don't need a lot of space for them. And there is a goldfinch feeding upon the zinnias. Or here's another annual caught a verbena, a hummingbird favorite. It's an annual and again, it's in some flower pots. My point is that even a few plants will attract these tiny birds. So welcome spring and have fun this summer watching the unique world of birds. Thank you.